From a defabricated solar-powered garden shed in Rockland County, New York, USA, this is Stand Up with Pete Dominic. On today's episode, how to keep your sanity during your next visit from your weird uncle when he starts boasting about being immunized. And now, the podcast host who has no need for such bravado because he is actually vaccinated, Pete Dominic. <laughs> That's right. From just about everything, there is a vaccination for. Thank you, Pete Co. as always, and thank you to you for pressing play on today's podcast. I have a pretty big deal guest, a pretty brilliant guy, perhaps the world's most widely known cited water expert. Dr. Peter Glick joins me. He is, of course, a scientist and the co-founder of the Pacific Institute, which is a leading independent research group devoted to reimagining water for a changing world. And we talked about his new book, which is so important, so fascinating, and it was a great conversation. I think you're going to love it. It's called The Three Ages of Water, Prehistoric Past, Imperiled Present, and A Hope for the Future. I'm really proud of this conversation. Very happy to have talked to Peter for the first time. Great guy. And if you want to jump ahead to it, it begins at 21 minutes in. But otherwise, I've got some great sound to play for you today. A bunch of clips, news stories. So... I'll get that started in 30 seconds, but in case you are not a paid subscriber, in case you didn't read the daily email that I sent yesterday, what I wrote was that thank you for your patience. The last couple of days and the next couple of weeks are going to be fairly erratic in terms of my schedule and my responsibilities to things and people. And then on the 27th of August, I will be flying Dan Enda. I'm headed to Oz, folks. I am going to Australia for about... Nine days to visit my good friend and his family who's be going to be celebrating his 50th birthday. And I'm really excited about that. If anybody listens in Australia, if anybody knows anything about Australia or has any advice about a 20 hour flight, I am open to listening. Stand up at gmail.com on any advice on my Australian trip. But plan on talking to some folks down there. I'm really looking forward to interviewing and also. Just talking to my friend about male relationships and ours and how special and unique and important it has been to both of us. Really looking forward to being with David Campbell and his family down there in Australia. He's a public person. He's a broadcaster down there, co-host of the Today Show down there. He's a very well-known, respected musician, singer, songwriter, and his dad is the biggest name in all of Australian music, Jimmy Bounds, Cold Chisel. Fascinating dude, family, and I'm very excited to see he and his wife, Lisa, and their twins and their oldest son. It's going to be great. I've never been there. I'm really looking forward to it. A little bit nervous, but I will be a little bit erratic in posting, maybe. So I appreciate your patience and forgiveness. There'll be some days where I'll put up a whole bunch and uh, maybe a day or two where I don't get anything. So we'll figure it out, but then we'll get back to normal when I return to the States on August 9th, and we'll see about the Hangouts. All right, that was more than 30 seconds. But I just wanted regular listeners to know what to expect. So thank you very much. For your indulgence on that, and I'll talk more about it at this Thursday night's Hangout. So if you're a paid subscriber, be there. If not, sign up now at patreon.com slash Pete Dominic. All right, let's get to some of those big news stories. And yesterday was a monster news day. A lot to report, quickly mention, a few clips I want to play. But when it's a big story like this one, the former president being indicted, let's let the gravitas of NBC News, Lester Holt, take over. Tonight, breaking news, former President Trump says he could be indicted again, this time by the federal grand jury, investigating attempts to overturn the results of the 2020 election and the January 6th riot. The former president says he received a target letter from special counsel Jack Smith, lashing out at Smith and calling him deranged. While in Michigan, the first charges of their kind, 16 people, so-called false electors, indicted, accused of scheming to overturn the election. Yes. That's right, Lester Holt. A huge story yesterday coming out of Michigan. Let's let the attorney general there, the powerful Dana Nessel, explain what this is about. As part of the orchestrated plan, we allege that 16 Michigan residents met covertly in the basement of Michigan GOP headquarters and knowingly and of their own volition signed their names to multiple certificates stating that they were 
the duly elected and qualified electors for president and vice president of the United States of America for the state of Michigan. That was a lie. They weren't the duly elected and qualified electors, and each of the defendants knew it. They carried out these actions with the hope and belief that the electoral votes of Michigan's 2020 election would be awarded to the candidate of their choosing instead of the candidate that Michigan voters actually chose. Well, there you go. How about it? I mean, this was a big day for justice, of course. And I just can't imagine being one of those people that is going to go to jail for Donald Trump, someone who does not care about them at all and obviously only cares about himself. But I mean, this fake elector scheme, how, how did you not think that that was a bad idea? I mean, were these Michigan fake electors in this Republican Party basement talking about this? Did anybody ever say, yeah, listen, uh, Steve, I, I don't know. I don't know about this fake elector scheme to help keep Trump in office. I mean, what if it could come back to bite us? Nobody said that in that dumbass Michigan Republican cult. And now they are most likely going to go to jail, which is a huge story coming out of Michigan and a warning to all of these other states where they also ran this stupid scheme of fake electors. Hey, do you want to be a fake elector? No, no, I don't think so. I'm good. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. I'd, I'd rather not be. And now let's head up to Capitol Hill, where there was a lot happening yesterday. We had a couple different hearings, including in a very little watch appropriations committee hearing. And Congresswoman Chrissy Houlihan tweets, a lot of happens in committees that goes unnoticed. But I want all Americans to know that what Republicans in the appropriations committee are doing right now, they're trying to strip community project funding for organizations related to our LGBT plus communities, including one in our district of Pennsylvania six. Well, Representative Mark Pocan was certainly not taking that sitting down. He stood up and in more ways than just literally. And I got to say, all four minutes and 30 seconds is, is fire, in my opinion. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I was just wondering if the chair of the subcommittee would yield to a question. Um, can you tell me on the, the drag show that was uh, funded in Ecuador, how much was that? I have it here. Sure. Uh, it's question. actually even on the web page. It wasn't a lot of money, uh, but it was a drag show. Uh, I, as a matter of fact, if you'd like, I'd just give you this document. No, I'm just asking you, and I don't want to use all my time up. So you could just answer the question. I'd all appreciate right. It. I believe that one in Ecuador, I believe, was $20,000. For, for one drag show. For, I don't know if it was one or multiple, but I have it here and I can share it with you. I, cause I think it was for 13 drag shows and it was for two workshops and it was for a two minute video for $21,000. Okay. So probably under a grand for a drag show if it was funded that way. Correct. Here it is. Yeah. But does that sound reasonable? What I just said uh, again, I have it here. I've, I've, I haven't looked at this document in detail in sure. a little while, but, but uh, it is all here. It's also on the internet again. Uh, I'm not sure how funding drag shows abroad sure. helps our national security interests, sure. uh, which is what we're discussing. And remember, I which brought is, that up sir, be because, because back, I heard that, I heard that they were not been doing it. Here back. it is. Sure. I'm going to take back my time. And w w just one more question. Was that rescinded by any chance, that grant? This may have been pulled. Uh, oh, 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 wait, no. wait, wait, wait. So we didn't spend $21,000 on 13 drag shows, two workshops, and a two-minute video. So $1,000 on so the So that's why you should up. not be upset that we're not funding drag shows. If they're not doing it, why is it a big deal to not fund it? Right. And if Thank they're you. doing I'll, it, I'll back that's my not time. funded. I'll take back my time. So this is interesting. So you're, you're worried about a grant that never occurred, which you could have told us up front. No, it was rescinded. It, it was rescinded. So anyway, the pride flags that you're so passionate about, uh, costs somewhere between, if you look online, 25 to $40. We are micromanaging, pedantically dealing with this budget at such a small level in order to you to make certain people in your base happy and in your caucus happy who've built a brand around hate. So in doing so, you're doing the silliness of determining whether $25 flags can come out of the appropriations budget. That is pedantic and crazy, quite honestly, that that's what we're debating. We have a drought, genocide, child labor, child marriage, disease, famine, malnutrition, droughts, all sorts of things that we could be dealing with. And what we are dealing with is talking about a $25 flag or a rescinded grant. Now, let's just be honest among friends. 
that this isn't for appropriations purposes. We're doing this because you're desperate to get the votes together and you've got some folks who need this sort of stuff who are still not going to vote for it, by the way. I'm willing to bet any of you on whether or not we get the 12 bills done, by the way, uh, through the floor completely. But let's just admit what we're doing. A rescinded grant, that would have been good information to share during your remarks. And a $25 flag is hardly the level that we should be debating here in the Appropriations Committee. And just for the record, in World War II, uh, there was a show called This is the Army. 113 performances on Broadway raised 45000 the first night for the Army Relief Fund, $10 million overall with, um, oh, guess what? Soldiers in drag. And, and then they did a movie on this called This is the Army, and guess who starred in it? Wait for it. Your friend, mine, Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan was in the movie This is the Army about the soldiers doing drag that raised $10 million for uh, the Army Relief Fund. By the way, the highest grossing movie at the time, three times what Wizard of Oz had gotten at that point. Now, so for all the, the worries about, I think you said, the focus on foreign threats that we're dealing with, a pride flag is not a foreign th threat. A drag show is not a foreign threat. Ronald Reagan is not a foreign threat. But having this kind of rhetoric on the floor so you can get people who want to pander and fundraise to certain aspects of your base is a threat to this democracy. So I just want to put it out there. I didn't plan on debating, but every time you put this stupid crap up that has nothing to do with appropriations, I'm going to stand up and say something. I yield back. Oh, so powerful. And I was really inspired. I reached right out to him and asked him to come on for an interview. There were more sparks after that at that hearing with that congressman. I highly recommend you go listen to all of that. Also, now I want to head over to check in with our favorite congresswoman, Jasmine Crockett, who was just here on the program a couple weeks ago. And she had to respond to this other uh, crazy congresswoman, Luna you know, this lady who said you got to read Breitbart. Well, listen to this. This is a good one minute. Um, are you aware that China does not like the United States and that has engaged in espionage activities against the United States? I don't have any personal professional knowledge of, of that. OK, well, I suggest you read Breitbart. It never ceases to amaze me what will come out of some of my colleagues mouths. <laughs> so it was suggested that you should read. Breitbart and I, I couldn't let it go. And so just for the general public, because I don't want anybody to believe that that's a good idea. I just got on Google, which if you have a cell phone, we can all do that. Breitbart News Network is an American far right syndicated news opinion and commentary website founded mid 2007 by American conservative commentator Andrew Breitbart. Breitbart News content has been described as misogynistic, xenophobic and racist by academics and journalists. So I don't know that that's where I want anybody to take their cues from, especially when they're trying to run this country. <laughs> that part. And then let me clear up another little part. Oh, my God. That was real, real good. Uh, now let's head over to another hearing committee here. I don't know where all these committees are start, starting to look them up to explain. Like, you don't really care what committees these necessarily were in. You know, the players. This is. Eric Swalwell uh, going after Congressman Jim Jordan, who is the uh, chairman, I think, of this committee. Anyway, this is pretty great. One minute. It never gets old that Chairman Jordan is complaining about subpoena compliance. We're approaching 500 days since Chairman Jordan has failed to comply with a lawfully issued subpoena for the greatest crime ever committed in America, a crime where more people have been arrested, more people have been prosecuted, his country has asked him to assist in the investigation, and he has refused to comply. Yet he is all too eager to bring to this committee uh, people who are working hard for the government, working hard for taxpayers, to carry out the mission of health and human services, to carry out the mission of the State Department. He's too good to honor a subpoena, but he has complaints, real complaints, about what these hardworking government officials are doing. Again, it's never going to get old. It's never going to be taken seriously. Thankfully, these witnesses are willing to do something that Chairman Jordan is not willing to do, which is actually show up and answer questions. Oh, more fire from Eric Swalwell about uh, Jim Jordan. And now let's head over to Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who's speaking out in defense of uh, Dreamers yesterday, uh, DACA recipients. I thought this was also great. I do not know a group 
of people that oftentimes are more patriotic to this country than DACA recipients. They give and they give and they give to a country that does not love them back in their actions. Yet 74% of Americans, Republican and Democrat, believe in a path to citizenship for DACA recipients. For children who were brought here and made this place their home, these DACA recipients are emblematic of the American dream. They are America's proof of concept. And to strip and undermine that is to undermine ourselves in this institution. If there's any individual that believes in stripping Medicaid from DACA recipients, I would like to know if they are willing to give the $6.6 billion that DACA recipients pay in federal taxes back to them. Are we willing to refund the $3.3 billion in state and local taxes that they pay back to them so that they can afford their own health care? This shouldn't even be a question right now. And with that, I yield back. All right. AOC yesterday at a hearing on Capitol Hill. And now let's listen to the new Biden for president ad where he just uses Marjorie Taylor Greene's actual own words. This is pretty wild. They just used her words and put music behind it. And she's doing the job for him. Joe Biden approves of this message. Joe Biden had the largest public investment in social infrastructure and environmental programs that is actually finishing what FDR started that LBJ expanded on. And Joe Biden is attempting to complete programs to address education, medical care, urban problems, rural poverty, transportation, Medicare, Medicaid, labor unions. And he still is working on it. All right, there you go. That's a new ad that the Biden for President campaign has put out with Marjorie Taylor Greene's own message, uh, own, own words. All right, one more from yesterday. I know it's a lot, but Democratic Florida Congressman Jared Moskowitz cracked up a witness at a hearing. We tried to schedule a raid on his home to have his gas stove seized. This is pretty good. He was talking to Department of Energy Secretary for Science and Innovation, Dr. Geraldine Richmond, at a subcommittee on economic growth. There, finally, I got one of them. Chair, recognize our friend from Florida, Mr. Mouskowitz. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you uh, for allowing me to wave on. By the way, I love when we tell only half the story. Mr. Trumka, who obviously, you know, is just super important to folks here, uh, came out afterwards and clarified his comments and said that we are not coming to take anyone's gas stoves away. Um, so... Dr. Richmond, I, I have a question, and I'm sorry for this line of questioning, but I think it, it, it's important because of the messaging that has now not gone on in just this hearing, but a, a markup and a previous hearing. Um, when are you coming to, to take my gas stove away? And will I get a four-hour like window, like when Comcast comes to my house or the, or the power company? Because I, I just want to be home when it happens because I have a dog and I don't want him to be let out by accident. So what, can, can we schedule that now? When are you coming? I'm sorry for laughing, but I have two dogs and chickens. So it's <laughs> OK. We're not coming. OK, we're not coming. All right. There you go. That's all the sound I got for you. Almost 20 minutes of it took a while to aggregate. So hopefully you appreciate that stuff. If not, you can always skip ahead to the interview. But in other news stories that I didn't mention, it was a really bad day for Donald Trump because the Georgia Supreme Court also dismissed his petition to block that state's investigation in his efforts to overturn the 2020 election. And of course, he's been notified that he's a target in the January 6th criminal investigation by special counsel Jack Smith, who, by the way, for his part, after that was announced, by Trump himself, went out and got a sandwich at Subway Sandwiches, and everybody was at just interpreting that as Jack Smith's way of telling Donald Trump that he's not affected by his threats and his shenanigans each and every day. So pretty big deal yesterday, of course. What else can I tell you? Well, how about that's it? Uh, a North Korean has detained a U.S. soldier who ran over to North Korea. That's a pretty interesting story. And... uh well, that's all I've got for you. How about we get to my guest? Yeah, he is a real smart guy. And I had what I thought was a pretty good conversation. I think I did 
a real good interview with Dr. Peter Glick, who is perhaps the world's most widely known and cited water expert. He went to Yale and Berkeley, went on a co-fund, found the Pacific Institute, which is a leading independent research group devoted to reimagining water for a changing world. He's a scientist by training. He's a winner of a MacArthur Foundation Genius Award and an elected member of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences. In 2018, he was awarded the Carl Sagan Prize for Science Popularization and his new book, The Three Ages of Water, Prehistoric Past, Imperiled Present, and a Hope for the Future, is what we talked about. And in the book, he guides us through the long, fraught history of our relationship to this precious resource, water being shaped by civilizations, empires, and driven centuries of advances in science and technology, from agriculture to aqueduct, steam power, space exploration, and progress in health and medicine. So much to talk about with Dr. Peter Glick. You can find all of his social media links, more about him, and getting the book in today's show notes. Let's do it. First timer right now. Oh, wow. There he is. A big, big deal scientist and author. Peter, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining me. Oh, I'm very happy to be here. Thanks for having me on. This book is so good. I am so thoroughly enjoying every section of it. And uh, your writing, man, really beautiful. Congratulations, because clearly you put your your heart into this. And I'm sure I don't know how long it took you, but I bet you it wasn't easy. No, it took me my whole life. <laughs> But but every author loves to hear that. Thanks. I, I love 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 to hear your comments. So. Yeah. Yes. Um, ah, so much to get to. Let's talk about the way that you wrote this, because I think that's almost the, the best way to get into it. The three ages of water, prehistoric past, imperiled present and hope for the future. That's your framing. That's Peter Glick's framing and the way you laid out the book, basically the past, the present and the future. Right. Yes, that's right. Uh, I've been working on water for a long time. I'm a scientist by training, but but I've worked on water, which, of course, is connected to everything all of us really care about. Uh, and it's tied up with the whole entire history of not just humanity, but the planet and the universe. And uh, so I thought it might be best to talk about the past of water and the role that it's played in our present and my thoughts about what it means for the future. And I love the history here. Uh, it's, I would say, part one and two, right? Because we're living in the kind of the present section, but also you go through over recent history since industrialization and so on, agriculture. But I mean, it's, it, it, I'm, it doesn't seem objective. This seems like journalism, like you did scientific journalism on the history of water's necessity to the planet and then later to humans. Fair to say? Yes, I think that's right. You know, I love history myself, even though I'm a scientist by training. But I really believe that uh, the history of water in the formation of the planet and the evolution of humanity and the way our society developed, uh, the way science and culture and art interacted with water uh, tells us so much about where we are today, uh, helps inform sort of the, the crises that we're facing, but also has a lot to say about where we ought to be going. Two quick things before I ask my next question. One, there's a happy ending, a possible ending, and then it's a very positive view that you have. You go different ways, you say, and you spell them both out. But you you are an optimist, and I want people to know that this is going to be not going to be doom and gloomier necessarily. And also, I've decided uh, that when you say one word over and over in a conversation as long as ours that people are hearing, it could get annoying. So I will be donating $10 every time either one of us says water to whatever you say the best charity is here. Okay, that makes it easier on the listener. You write, water is special, and that we need to understand it differently from other aspects of the natural world. Sir, what makes water so special? And how do we need to understand it differently than what? Fire? Well, so water, you know, without, without water, there wouldn't be life as we know it. Obviously, we only have one example but humanity developed and, and the entire planet developed because we have liquid water and we have frozen water and we have, we have water vapor. We sort of have water in all its forms. And that let, let life develop the way, the way it developed. But it's also special, not just because it's the root of our in very existence, but it's connected to human health and ecosystem health and agriculture and industrial production and all the things we care about are related to water. Um, and so I think of it as, you know, other than air, 
which of course we need to breathe. It's the most important thing to us. And it's so tied to all that that we do and think and care about that uh, it, it needs to be thought about in a special way. You also write, uh, yeah, I guess the most important thing that you didn't necessarily even mention is, I mean, you mentioned it briefly, is that we are made up of water, our our lives. So if we're t- I guess maybe you weren't thinking about this, the human species in that you were being um, less selfish than I am, but we ourselves are made up a, a lot of water. And so that's why it's different than other elements. Yes, that's exactly right. Of course, I think 70, 70 to 80 percent of our hearts and our brains are are made up of water. There's a funny quote, which I'm not going to get without looking it up directly at the beginning of the book from Star Trek, where some alien describes humans as basically uh, ugly bags of, giant bags of mostly water, ugly giant bags of mostly water. Well, that, well, there you go. That's sort of what we, what we are. You're right. Uh, water, that, water made us long before we tried to control, manage, and manipulate it. It has a special place in our hearts and minds, literally and figuratively. The heart and brain are both more than seventy three percent water. But water is also central to the story of human development. Um, it's so great. Your writing is wonderful. I'm really enjoying it and getting to talk to you. But let's go back to let's let's not be selfish. You're so selfish, sir. Uh, no, I was being by thinking about like the human uh, where where humans play in. But I think it's like how, how many millions and millions of years before humans that water had a central role in all of the different ecosystems, ecosystems on the planet, right? Let's talk about before humans first. Okay, so uh, we like can go all the way back. Met oxygen, even. We can go all the way back to the Big Bang. So, so the Big Bang, I don't know, 13 plus billion years ago, our understanding is that hydrogen sort of formed right away, like literally, I don't know, minutes or a few thousand years maybe after the Big Bang, there was hydrogen. Oxygen took a little longer. Oxygen, the first, first stars had to form. They grew, they got old, they exploded, they created oxygen. Uh, once you had oxygen and hydrogen, you had water. And now everywhere we look in the universe, there's water. Uh, there was water at the beginning of the formation of Earth four billion years ago. Uh, and we believe that water was fundamental to the ultimate evolution of life on the planet. And, you know, without water, there wouldn't, there wouldn't be life here. Uh, And so, yes, water comes in at the very beginning of our own stories. My understanding, and I have a deep understanding, sir, I'll have you know, (laughs) of nothing. Uh, Evolution is that we came from the water. I mean, like not only us, but everything else crawled out of it or something, right? And Yeah, that's right. So, so again, the biologists believe that... (laughs) <laughs> if it weren't for some weird little species of fish a long time ago that developed the ability to to form legs, <laughs> that the whole process ultimately leading to dinosaurs and then the extinction of the dinosaurs and the survival of mammals and the evolution of Homo sapiens probably wouldn't have occurred. It's just you know here we are, so obviously we're talking about it, but um, but w- water was important from the beginning. It was important from the beginning and the beginning uh, section, first age of water, part one of your book, which is really fascinating, uh, leads to, of course, the I'm thinking about how to talk about this because I could skip around so much. But the second age of water, I feel like to me, to me, it's the most interesting because I can uh, it's about humanity and it's about understanding our own history coinciding with the history of water not only here, but around our planet. And of course, part three can, can get be ominous, except for your positive message, but we'll get to it, of course. Um, take us up to the end of the first age and the beginning of the second age. What was, what was going on then? So we had in the first age, uh, which I, I call the prehistoric past, um, the evolution of humanity, which climate change and water had a big role to play in, the migration of humanity out of Africa, also where water had a huge role to play, where conditions were ripe and, and humans were able to move out of Africa and survive uh, to the Middle East and then in the Indus Valley and China and then across ultimately to, to North and South America. You mentioned, I think you're probably going to say it, but I just want to make sure because I thought it's really fascinating. Most of human fossils were found on, I think, riverbanks in Africa and, and, and elsewhere or a lot of them, right? Yes, there, there's no doubt that the evolution of Homo sapiens, our species, 
came about because we were the species who were able to manipulate the hydrologic cycle to deal with extremes of floods and droughts uh, to survive where other species of hominins, the early, early uh, species that we evolved from, weren't as successful. It was our ability to deal with water and climate that I think led to our ultimate success. But now the, now the first age also includes the first empires, the first cultures, the first agriculture, uh, when we realized right. that we could grow food reliably if we manipulated the water cycle. We could maybe protect ourselves a little bit from floods and, and droughts by building little reservoirs and irrigation systems. This rudimentary management of, of water by early cultures was really the also part of the first age. Let's quickly just talk, because I think it matters to as the development of humanity, the hydrological cycle. I mean, I could explain it or you could explain it, but basically it's renewable. And I think people understand how it rains and it evaporates and, and so on. But you can go into a little bit more about why it's so important that it's this renewable source of that water is renewable. And more importantly, Obviously, I know it's, you know, not renewable and all the groundwater. And you talk about the some of the rivers like the the, the uh, Colorado River, and I think, and the Yellow River. But it make the point about hydrological cycle and why it matters to the development of human beings or human beings being able to harness it. Well, Pete, I'm sure as you remember from second grade, the, the hydrologic cycle is sort of the basic cycle of the planet. The basic cycle, it's, it's part of the climate cycle. It's evaporation of water from the oceans and land up to the atmosphere and the formation of clouds, uh, precipitation out of the atmosphere back onto the ground in the form of rain and snow and runoff in the rivers back to the oceans. That's the hydrologic cycle. It's powered by the sun. It's part of the climate system. It's renewable, as you say, uh, but it's not in it's not unaffected by human activities. And, you know, we can talk about that a little bit bit later. Uh, but the hydrologic cycle is what puts water in our rivers. It's what recharges our groundwater. It's what feeds our crops. Um, it's what it provides all of the water resources that humanity uses. How much of uh, as a result of that do do we know why humanity developed where they developed? You think about like Ireland and their arable so soil or, or Ukraine or or anywhere in the West. And and you look at where human beings were and where they were either helped or, you know, at times hurt because of some kind of famine and some, some kind of uh, even naturally occurring drought? Well, of course, we evolved in Africa where the conditions were ripe and where the species were appropriate for, for the millions of years of evolution that it took to create humanity, Homo sapiens. Um, but the water conditions were an important part of that. Uh, you know, we, we know that, as you said earlier, the fossils that we've recovered are a long places where there was reliable water resources, where there were rivers, where there was enough reliable food to support support evolving populations over literally millions of years. What was the finding that really was a breakthrough for uh, humanity? I mean, the idea that you could drill down and get water out of the ground in different places and not have to get it from the surface? Well, you know, I think, I think there were lots of them. Uh, but basically, I think it was the idea that uh, we could manipulate the hydrologic cycle to our advantage. We could figure out ways in dry periods to, can, to still get water and grow food. Uh, we could survive during really wet periods and floods and not be totally wiped out. It was the ability to manipulate the environment, which, of course, is such a characteristic of, of humanity anyway. And yet we can't do the simplest solution, which I've offered for years, and I don't know why anyone won't do it. And I knew I was going to tell you this at some point during the book and uh, insult your intelligence. But the issue now with the climate crisis, uh, well, it's always been this way uh, in terms of the climate. The east, the northeast gets a lot more water than the west, southwest, et cetera. That's the issue. We're getting too much water. They're not getting enough. Why don't we build a nice fat pipeline, Peter. Why, why is that such a, why do I have to come up with all of the brilliant engineering solutions? Why can't smart people like yourself? Well, so in fact, one of the major characteristics of water on the planet, as you, as you mentioned it, is, is that it's badly distributed in space and time. You know, we have wet areas, we have dry areas, we have wet seasons, we have dry seasons. 
Obviously, there are places on the planet that have incredibly large amounts of water and others that are incredibly dry. That's just the natural distribution of water on the planet. And part of the second age of water, which is our growing ability to understand and manipulate the hydrologic cycle and the science of water and all of that, uh, has involved big infrastructure. It involves big dams, so we store water in wet periods so we can use it in dry periods and produce hydropower. Uh, it involves big pipelines and aqueducts to move water from one place to another. But ultimately, this is sort of a, what you're asking, and I get asked this a lot, is, is really ultimately an economic and a political question. And of course, so many of our problems ultimately right. revolve around economics and politics. But just to be clear, you're saying you're not saying that. The, I mean, you're saying this about a, a lot of the issues around water that we have the technology. We actually have the solutions. It's political issues and special interests and and profits and, and, and human greed that or in, inability to figure out how to apply them that are the problem. Yeah, you know, it, for water, though, it's a little more complicated than that. Okay. Um, absolutely. We have the technology. We could build a pipeline from the Great Lakes or the Mississippi River to the Western U.S. Uh, there have been lots of proposals to do so, lots of engineers. And I also have an engineering degree. You know, look look to these sort of mechanical, technical. Well, I don't, sir. And I'm, all I'm telling you is giant funnel. I mean, why do I have to give my ideas away? Giant funnel, like the size of an arena, sir. So, so part of the challenge, of course, is that ultimately the value of water in place versus the cost of moving water from one place to another right. has to balance. Um, and the pol that's not just an economic question, it's a political question. Uh, the people in the Great Lakes, which involves eight states and three provinces in Canada, have some fundamental objections to the idea of taking water out of the Great Lakes and moving it to the Western U.S. Same with the Mississippi River, which, you know, sometimes is really dry. You know, we're having a drought right now on the Mississippi. So there isn't always excess water. And another big problem turns out that the Rocky Mountains are kind of in the way. And when you have to pump water over mountains, the cost gets exorbitant. We not just have a expensive. drill bit that we could just go through the mountain. We do, but it's a money question. It's too expensive. And the value of the water that at the place where we would get it is less than the cost of the water of moving it, like and any good good or service. There are you know, yeah. it, Peter, the reason we the, the reason we don't put water in super tankers and move it from wet areas across the ocean to dry areas is because when you put oil in a super tanker, you have about two hundred and fifty million dollars worth of oil. It's a really valuable commodity. If you were to fill that same super tanker with water, it would be it would be maybe a million dollars or a few hundred thousand dollars. The value of the water is much less, and it costs a lot of money to operate a super tanker, and it's just not economic. And also, I would imagine like the idea of if you did the math on the on the carbon footprint of that water is so heavy, so so it's really energy intensive to move. Exactly. That's right. Water is so very I heavy. suggest build the pipeline very high on the East Coast, sir. Very high, like, you know, thousands of feet. And then it slowly, gradually could also double as a water slide. No one listens to my ideas. It's a shame. Um, on the contrary, your ideas are brilliant, except that. So, for example, in California, where we have extensive infrastructure to move water from one place to another, it's precisely because we start that water in the mountains. Right. And gravity is our friend. Right. We move it downhill. It's cheap. You don't have to pump it very much. And that water is incre incre incredibly cure, uh, pure and it's valuable to the end user. And so we do move water from one place to another when gravity is on our side. Well, let's just stay on this for one more moment, kind of skipping around here, because you can speak to current issues in the United States where water is, you know, not being distributed uh, fairly, equitably. But also you can talk about the politics around them. And I think the most uh, important place right now it seems to be getting a lot of attention. Major news on uh, on, on, a, on an agreement recently on the several states that depend on the Colorado River. But you can pick anywhere you want to explain uh, a, a current issue around water that we have and why. Well, the Colorado is a wonderful example. Yeah. It's sort of a problem. It's a it's a river that uh, it's the most important river in the southwestern United States. The only major river. It's ultimately not that huge of a river. You know, the mm -hmm. Columbia River, I think, is probably 10 times the average flow of the of the Colorado. So it's not a big river. Uh, it crosses seven states. It's shared by seven states and Mexico. So it's an international river. We have an agreement 
with Mexico about sharing it. It's grossly over allocated, which by which I mean we've given away more water to users than nature actually provides us reliably. Um, uh, it's a vulnerable to climate change. Climate change is ha already having clear effects on the Colorado River. It's one of those places where sort of all of the problems come together and where ultimately, if you know, if we can figure out how to solve the problems on the Colorado, we could solve a lot of water problems elsewhere. Why is it so hard to figure out? I'm sure you could talk to me for an hour about that. But is that also politics and different states' interests? Oh, absolutely. So, so obviously, it's a hydrologic problem in the sense that it's not a big river. There's a lot of demand on it. But it's ultimately a political problem as well, because the Colorado is managed and shared by seven states and Mexico. Um, there are multiple legal agreements set up over over many, many decades, many of which are outmoded that don't say anything about climate change or about the real nature of population growth and demand in the region. Uh, one way to think about it is that that we're, we're managing our water with 21st century technology and 19th century institutions and laws. Uh, and if we can figure out how to get the laws and the institutions up to date, we have a better shot at, at solving some of these challenges. But I feel like the, the, the harder challenge is always some kind of, you know, profit motive, some type of capitalist venture. And, you know, I mean, it's not I'm not saying it's all evil. I mean, I'm not a cap a fan of capitalism, but I'm saying agriculture isn't isn't inherently evil. We need the food. But do we need soybeans or do we need almonds or other water intensive things? And then you get uh, all caught up with the different lobbies, which all collude together in, in one, I'm sure. I mean, I don't understand completely how that specific sector works. And I'm only talking about agriculture. There are so, all kinds of other interests tied up uh, with the Colorado River, much less the Great Lakes or anywhere else where money matters, too. Right. Absolutely. Now, agriculture is a really big issue here. Yeah. 80% uh, of the water that humans use worldwide goes to agriculture. And that's true in the United States. It's true in the Western U.S. It's sort of a benchmark. We got so many humans. Rule of thumb, and we have to feed them. And, yeah. and the agricultural revolution, the Green Revolution, was a revolution of irrigation technology as much as anything else. And it was a great thing. But we have to rethink agriculture because it's such a large demand for water. But economics alone isn't enough. So, again, the Colorado is a good example of this. Uh, we we spend most of the Colorado River water on agriculture, a lot of it on low valued agriculture like alfalfa, which we feed to cows or we export to Saudi Arabia. But we don't allocate the water of the Colorado based on economics. We allocate it based on old water rights and old water laws. So if economics alone were playing a role Maybe farmers would grow more valuable crops. Maybe more of the water would go to industrial uses that are high valued rather than agriculture. But it's based on these old water rights where we gave away the right to use water independent of economics. And so that's when I talk about the need to reform politics and, and laws and institutions. That's an important part of it. Uh, while we're on that subject, what about regulation specifically dealing with pollution uh, as specifically dealing with the federal government, much less state government's EPAs, and what the Supreme Court has decided the EPA can and can't do on water. Because my understanding, and uh, if, if you've written about that, I haven't gotten to it yet, is that in this book, I know you know a lot about it, is that is a major setback for uh, water regulation. Well, so I think regulation is, a, is an important part of the solution, but I also believe in technology. I believe in economics, smart economics. I believe in a whole whole suite of solutions, but there's absolutely a role for regulation. Uh, you know, the environmental crises of the 1960s in the United States, the burning of the Cuyahoga River, the oil pollution from Santa Barbara oil spills in the ocean, that triggered and, and, and set off part of the major environmental revolution of the time. And that led to some major, really important regulations, the Clean Water Act, the Federal Clean Water Act, the Federal Safe Drinking Water Act, that are sort of foundational laws in the United States that protect our water quality. Um, they're outmoded. They need to be updated, but they're, but they're key. But other regulations like smarter regulations on the efficiency of toilets and washing machines and dishwashers have also been an incredibly important tool in improving the efficiency of water use in the United States, a, a remarkable thing that people are not that, that aware of. So 
regulation is a piece of the solution. So that I, yeah, I you think- uh, say that uh, we use less water now than we did in the seventies because of some of those technological. Yes, this is this is an astounding fact that I think very few people know or understand, including people in the water world. We use less water today in the United States for everything, for agriculture, for our homes, for our industries, for power plants than we used in the 19, late 1970s. We use much less water per person because population has continued to grow. We produce a lot more economic benefit with a lot less water today than we used to. And that's because there's been a revolution in the efficiency of water use. There's been uh, efforts by farmers to grow more food with less water. We produce semiconductors today with a lot less water per chip than we used to. These are changes that this, this is part of the reason why I'm optimistic about our ability to move to a more successful, sustainable future, because I already see that we're making that transition. It would seem, and you write about this, and there's a long history of it, that the greatest technological in, in, innovation outside of my obvious suggestion about the very large pipeline would be desalination. Has anybody thought of that? Oh, sure. So uh, <laughs> the history of it, early Greeks would collect Evening do uh, uh, no, that's not it. That's not the desalination. The earliest known references to desalination date from the time of the ancient Greeks. Aristotle observed. I mean, it's uh, that's a it's not a new thing. I was just joking. It's not a new thing, but it's an important thing. Yeah. Um, you know, I give a lot of talks about water, and often, and I talk about desalination. But often, the very first question is sort of based on this desire for a silver bullet solution. That sure. We know that 97% of the planet's water is salt water. It's in the, in the oceans. It's too salty to drink. It's too salty to use crops. But we know, and the ancient Greeks knew, how to get fresh water out of salt water from evaporation, from boiling it and collecting the condensate. But modern technology has improved that. We now have smart technology with membranes that can separate salts from water. Uh, it's absolutely a solution, but it's an expensive solution. It has environmental challenges. And when we've improved the efficiency of water use, when we've recycled the water that we're already using and treated, uh, then ultimately desalination has an important role to play. And, we, you know, we see it already in the Persian Gulf. We see it in Israel. We see it in Singapore. Cal Southern California has one big desalination plant near San Diego. Very expensive, but it, it is an option ultimately for high valued uses of water. But you see that technology continuing to innovate to a point where I guess the issue wouldn't be how much energy again it takes to desalinate. Well, ultimately, the question is, you know, how much does it cost? Right. Uh, I mean, if energy, even if energy were free, Got which it. it never will be, uh, desalination is expensive. It's a lot of capital investment, a lot of infrastructure. Membranes have to be replaced constantly it's it's capital intensive yeah um but we've made ma massive improvements in recent years in desalination technology it's cheaper than it used to be the technology is better um we're i think approaching the limits of our ability to cut the costs for desalination but again for really high valued uses along the coast and places that have done the other things that are cheaper or more environmentally beneficial first uh it's absolutely an option Let's go back to uh, the second stage. You write, the earliest empires began to manipulate the world and the water around the building, rudimentary dams and aqueducts, inventing intentional irrigation, creating the first water laws and institutions and fighting wars over water. This age came to an end when rising human populations, expanding cities, the local depletion of wild plants and animals, the spread of water related diseases and growing pressures on natural resources demand humanity forge in a new relationship with water, which brings us there to the second stage. I mean, I could pick any number of those, but let's start with just cholera and uh, dysentery and other uh, diseases like that, because they're still in existence, sadly, in, in certain parts of the world, obviously, but mostly we, we've certainly been able to solve them. And that alone was huge, right? Yes, that's right. So, you know, water-related diseases have been pre pre present forever. Uh, in the first stage of water, we basically suffered the consequences from them. We didn't know what caused them. We didn't know how to deal with them. The second age of water, which was a, an age of industrial and scientific revolution and cultural revolutions, the Islamic Golden Age, the Renaissance in Europe, was a period when science started to tell us what water was and what water-related diseases were and how to solve them. 
And we know how now to solve cholera. We know what it is. We know how to prevent it. Cholera, dysentery, typhoid, the all of those diseases associated with bad or inadequate water. Um, and so the second age gave us the tools to solve many of our water problems, to satisfy growing populations with better irrigation systems and better food, uh, you know, to build bigger dams that that really could deal with floods and droughts and build aqueducts that went through mountains and over mountains rather than just a few kilometers to, to feed ancient cities. But the second age, which is our age, also hasn't solved all our water problems. We know how to solve cholera, but we haven't entirely solved water cholera. There's still water poverty. There's still water crises. And that's also a consequence of the second age. Talk about water poverty. Talk about how much we take for granted that when we turn on the sink, generally speaking, clean water comes out. Um, also talk about that we so often f uh, focus on these uh, foreign countries, underdeveloped countries, third world nations, whatever people refer to them as. And yet we've got Jackson, Mississippi, and we've got Flint, Michigan, and we have issues with our water here in the richest country in the world, too. And that has to do with laws and institutions and, and a lot more that you, you write about and address very well. Well, that's right. I, I call it water poverty. And by that, I mean, uh, it's the 21st century. And despite the fact that we know how to solve these problems, there are still billions of people that don't have access to safe water and adequate sanitation. And you and I are fortunate enough to live in a, a country where we can take that for granted. We get up in the morning, we turn on the tap, incredibly high quality incredibly cheap water comes out. Our wastes magically disappear when we flush our toilet or flush things down the drain. Um, and they go to some wastewater treatment plant that we don't even know about. But that's not true for the majority of people on the planet still. Uh, and as you so clearly point out, it's not also true for everybody in the United States. We have Flint, Michigan's and Jackson, Mississippi's where disadvantaged communities uh, may have had safe water at one point, but we've underinvested or failed to invest. And those, those populations no longer have access to safe water and sanitation. We have Native American communities who have never had access to safe water and sanitation. Populations in the Central Valley of California, especially farm worker communities that don't have safe water and sanitation. It's a scandal. That yeah, country I just heard of a tribal community in Arizona that has to drive miles with pickup trucks and carry heavy giant jugs just to get water. It's a disgrace. Yeah. Well, that's right. And you, you brought this up a minute ago and I, didn't, I forgot to comment on it. But um, the recent Supreme Court decision yeah. that that refused to provide assistance to the Navajo Nation to to satisfy their longstanding unsatisfied water rights in the Western United States is, is a travesty. That's the community I read about as a relations. I, I forgot that it related to that Supreme Court decision. Yeah, I'm glad. And that's you, that's right. And it's yeah. a step backward. Uh, you know, I like to think that in the long in the long arc of history, it's going to be seen as a, a, a minor step backward in our progress toward providing safe water and sanitation to everyone on the planet. But it's a, it was it was a travesty. We haven't really talked as much about climate change, but that's uh, kind of obvious why we, what we have been talking about the history of and many of the challenges that we've been talking about. But the greatest challenge, you know, that, that developed in the second age of water as we head into your third stage is man-made climate change. And what if anything we can do to slow its rapid pace, the fever that our planet is obviously suffering from for a very long time and will continue to suffer because baked in what we're doing today in the future is a lot of where you talk about, you know, developing in the second stage and, you know, the new way forward, as you title it, chapter 23 in the third stage. So one of the one of the big adverse consequences of the second age of water was our failure to understand or to care about or to deal with the environmental consequences of using water. You know, we we've took water where we found it. We've moved it thousands of miles. We we drain aquifers. We pave over wetlands. We take water out of our rivers. The Colorado River runs dry because we take it all. Uh, that has ecological consequences. And we're just now beginning to deal with those consequences. And one of the most significant environmental threats that faces us is climate change. I, I'm a climate scientist. I've worked on climate and water for er forever. I know you've had many climate scientists. You've had many conversations here about climate. I like to be friends with climate scientists. Some people say <laughs> it makes me biased. I say it does not. <laughs> Well, how how could <laughs> okay? We won't go there for yeah. right now. Um, 
Without a doubt, humans are changing the climate. That's undeniable. Uh, not to say that it's not denied, but it's undeniable. Right. And and some of the worst impacts of climate change will be on water resources, the hydrologic cycle. Higher temperatures means more evaporation. More water in the atmosphere means more intense rainstorms. We're already seeing more extremes of both floods and droughts. We know that sea level rise is going to affect coastal aquatic ecosystems and infrastructure we build on the coast. Climate climate change is a water problem. And uh, um, you, you always mention the mosquitoes, sir. Please mention the, the, the future mosquitoes. I always think we need to include how they develop as a result of the water, too, and the new diseases they can give us. Well, that's right. You know, it gets back to this issue of water related diseases. Yeah. You know, malaria, dysentery, dengue, yeah. all of these are are water related in the sense that they're they're caused by mosquitoes that are fundamentally tied to the water cycle. And of course, we already know that higher temperatures encourages the spread of pests, including yeah. mosquitoes. We've had just just I think in the last couple of years, the first cases of malaria in the United States that were not brought in by outside travelers that went somewhere and got malaria and yes. brought it back. Yeah. But actually, malaria here in the United we States and Florida. We did it. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to see more and more of that. And that's a climate issue and it's a water issue. And it's tied to all of these other factors. So what we can do about it uh, and, and, and the different ways that you see it going. You lay out a, a potential dystopian view and you lay out a much better view, which which I uh, would certainly obviously love uh, to come true. So maybe kind of lay out how this this can go and how this third stage could potentially go, because we're talking about the future now. I, I do believe we're in a transition right now. We're in a sort of an interesting time in history when all these crises are coming together. Uh, and I call the third age of water a, a hope for the future. I have a positive vision for this. I know that we can solve these problems. Uh, you know, I don't know that we will. I believe that we will. But I know that we can, depending on the choices we make. And I know that we can because I look all around me uh, in all the work that I've done over all these years, and I see farmers growing more food with less water. I see technology and regulations that improve the efficiency of water use. I see the ability to recycle and reuse water. I see ecosystems being restored, dams being taken down, and fisheries being restored and rivers coming back to health. The Cuyahoga River doesn't doesn't burn any longer because we've passed the Clean Water Act and we've tried to rein in industrial pollution. Um, uh, you know, some people say an optimist is just a badly informed pessimist, and, and I don't really believe that. Um, I know that we can solve these problems, and I know that the solutions are out there. Um, the challenge is seeing them, understanding them, and scaling them up faster and faster. What do you say to people who, uh, you know, kind of don't care about some of the efforts that are made to, say, regulate water? And in terms of, you know, you hear people like Senator Rand Paul and a lot of people yelling about, oh, we've got these uh, new efficient toilets or or sink heads or, or, or whatever. Like, how do you, you know, ha handle those situations? You mentioned the statistic of, uh, about but I mean, a lot of people don't care about sustainability, I guess, is what I'm driving at, unfortunately. Well, so you have to. That's why you need those policies. <laughs> you know, you understand politics probably better than I do. <laughs> but um, there are people who oppose things for political reasons. Uh, and that's different than opposing them because they don't understand the science. Um, in the climate world, there are climate deniers out there, and there's a whole range of them. Uh, there's some people who deny the science, and, and those people are just either totally ignorant or they're intentionally misleading right. everybody else. Um, the question about what to do about climate change, for example, is a political one. And there are lots of options. And this is true for water. You know, how do we solve our water problems? Do you only apply market solutions or do you apply technological solutions or do you apply regulations and government solutions? Those are political choices. And I believe that we need all of those solutions and then if you rule out the regulatory approaches because you don't believe in government or you don't want government to work, then you're blinding yourself to a whole set of things that can make life better. And so people who, for ideological reasons, say, I don't like this solution because I don't like the politics that's involved. I just think that's I just think that's a blind alley and it's a dangerous way to go. Yeah, it's filled with people, though, um, but but uh, but but probably not. 
nearly as many people to stay optimistic that are uh, not on the blind alley, that are, you know, eyes wide open and, and, and hopefully reading your book and, and studying your work because there's so much to learn, including about the idea of water wars. You often hear about water wars and, and Hollywood has all kinds of storylines, but you write about the, the, the past and current water wars. I mean, there are wars over water throughout human history. Say a bit about maybe the past and the future conflict over H2O. Trying to yeah, so I've worked, I've worked on water conflicts for a long, long time, the, what we call the field of environmental security. Um, and one of the things I do at the Pacific Institute, which is my, my research institute, uh, is we maintain something called the water conflict chronology. It's a database of water violence going back literally 4,500 years to the first age of water, the very first water war uh, that we know of, which was between the ancient Sumerian city-states of Uma and Lagash and what's now southern Iraq between the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers. And it was a war over irrigation canals and access to water, a war that went on for a century over multiple generations, really, you know, 2400 BC. But even today, we see violence associated with water, uh, not water wars per se, but water is a trigger of conflict or water and water systems as weapons used during conflicts or water or water systems that are targeted or casualties of conflicts like we've seen recently in, in Ukraine where the Kakovka Dam was destroyed by Russia, a, an attack on one of the biggest dams and reservoirs in, in Europe. A terrible uh, environmental disaster that's gone undercovered, in my opinion. Uh, a terrible, a terrible disaster and a, a terrible precedent for attacks on civilian infrastructure. But again, there's a long history of this. Um, uh, water and conflict are, are closely related. I hate to stop talking to you, but I will keep reading you. But here at the end, tell me any other thing that I didn't ask uh, or maybe I haven't read yet, because every page and every stage are fascinating in, in your new book. But leave me with whatever you want that I might have not asked uh, about or that we didn't cover. Well, let me say one thing that, that re reflects on something you mentioned a moment ago. Um, people really care about water. Uh you know, climate change, there's debate about the, the policies and the solutions, and the approaches, but but people ide un, unideologically, left and right and conservative and liberal, they want safe water. They want clean water. Uh, water has the has the ability to bring people together to to talk about some of the issues that maybe other challenges, other issues are too ideologically uh, constrained to address. And so. I know that we can solve our water problems. I know that there are lots of solutions in in law and policy and technology and economics. And I see us already moving forward in this transition to a more positive, sustainable third age of water. Um, as I say in the book, I know we can reach that positive future, the future that we would choose to go to if we had a choice. And the whole point is we do. We have a choice. Uh, let's make the decisions that move in the right direction and and aim for that that positive vision. Well, I hope every policymaker and stakeholder and listener uh, gets the book because it's a fascinating read for anybody. Just the first set. I mean, all of it. I've really enjoyed it. And I'm so happy to get the opportunity to talk to you for the first time. And I hope that you'll come back because when I finish the book, I'm going to want to cover all of the things that we didn't. Uh, I've learned so much already. Thank you, Dr. Peter Gleck. What an honor. Thanks very much, Peter. It's been a great conversation. Well, there you go. What did you think of Dr. Peter Glick and that conversation? I'd love to hear from you. As always, email me, standupwithpete at gmail.com, and go get that book. really is a fascinating read. I have learned so much in just a skim and preparing by listening to many of his other interviews, which is what I did uh, for this one. Peter Glick, really good, very good, and I can't wait to finish the book, which I will do. All right, that's it. It's all I've got for you on today's show. Hope you appreciated that news roundup, the clips. It was a lot of work, as it always is. This show takes many hours to produce each and every day, and I do it each and every day. I can't do it without your support. It's free, but it's not cheap. So please sign up for a paid subscription or consider paying a little bit more if you're getting a little bit more. So many people have done that so far this summer and I'm super grateful to all of you who have patreon.com slash Pete Dominic write rates uh, review write rates and review 
on YouTube and on Spotify and, of course, on iTunes. And follow me on all the social medias. I'm on all of the social medias usually, almost always, at Pete Dominic. That's it. That's all. I love you. I appreciate you. And I will talk to you tomorrow. On your fence, even if it ain't a very friendly audience, well, they'll begin to listen when you start making sense and you stand up, stand up. No need to point your rifle to defend your town, just stand up, stand up. You know they can't deny you what you're laying down, boy, you better stand up, stand up. Show your face of every color, yellow, black, red, and brown. Where every lost child will finally be found There's only one thing to do before we stand our ground And that's stand up, stand up Well, the founding fathers saw a land for all They had to stand up, they had to stand up They had a keen imagination for a crystal ball Drawing all the plans of stand up But all they had to go on was the time they were in with other causes for laws And since they weren't even sin They knew that change was gonna come Before the change could begin They had to stand up All right, they had to stand up We got to stand up We got to look the devil square in the eye We got to let him know It's his time to go And make it clear when all we hear is a lie See him flee the scene of that experiment If you stand up stand All right, up. we got to speak up We got to reach up And raise your voice in every way you know how Don't be toes up You got to show up Ain't no better time to do it but now No need to pledge allegiance to no one's and try Rise up Show obedience to the voice inside And listen well and it'll tell you not to run and hide It says stand